Hello everyone. My name is Michael Parsley. I work for the TWRA and I am what they call the R3 coordinator for the state and the assistant chief for the um, outreach and communication. So my job in the state is help people get out hunting and fishing. And uh, we're on a mission to teach people how to hunt and fish this year, as well as shoot. So uh, to that end, I thought for turkey season, we would start with a series with a guy that absolutely knows how to kill him. Uh, Matt Dale, he's on uh, YouTube at uh, Dale Outdoors. He's got his own channel there. He's also on uh, Instagram at Dale underscore outdoors. And he's on Facebook at Eyes of the Hunter Incorporated. He's uh, sponsored by Spring Fever Custom Calls. I've got, I've got one of their box calls. It's an excellent call. Uh, he's got his own uh, special box call. I know that he that he has had them make um, one turkey. He'll probably tell us something about that turkey at the end of today. But this guy absolutely knows how to kill them, and he can he can help us here in Tennessee learn how to chase down um, chase down these turkeys. Matt, uh, you got anything to add? You just want to start off. Well, uh, it's good to be with everybody, and uh, I love the great state of Tennessee. Hope to be a Tennessee resident here in a year or two, looking for a place. So uh, I, I love Tennessee. I've, I've, I was born and raised in the mountains of southwest Virginia, so uh, I've always spent a lot of time in Tennessee fishing, and I've deer hunted, uh, deer hunted in Tennessee. Never turkey hunted, but I want to. I may do that this year. So uh, definitely my kind of people. So I love Tennessee. It's actually my favorite state out of all 50 states. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on here. I just, I've always loved Tennessee. So good to be with everybody. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, the four stages of turkey season. You break your turkey season down into four stages. And I've seen a couple of, I've seen one video over the four stages. And then I've seen multiple videos where you actually do some hunts and calling in each stage. And they're all different. Um, yeah. Tell us, tell us uh, how you start off the year and what that stage is. Well, my season usually starts in March. You know, of course, I travel and turkey hunt. So, so uh, our season, where I'm currently living in Missouri, it don't start till, you know, probably about the third week of, of April. So we get we get we get started late here. So uh, with video and and trying to and trying to do this professionally, I have to travel. So my season usually starts in March, and what I what I've seen based over 30 years of turkey hunting is uh, now now these dates that I've got are just estimate. They're not you know they're not like by the turkey bible if there was one. This is just estimate, and it kind of can vary depending on where you live at. Because you know if you live up a little bit north, the dates may be pushed back you know a little bit. Uh, if you live extreme south like Florida maybe South Alabama, it may be a little bit different because their spring starts a lot earlier. But I think if you narrow it down, if your turkey seasons, and I think Tennessee, what do y'all start the last week of March? Yeah. I think right around there. So see, you get all four phases. Um, another reason why I want to move there, because you get all four phases um, in this. So phase one, I kind of take this around March the 20th to about April the 8th right around this, right around that two week period there, uh, two or three week period, I think that could be phase one. So when your season starts in Tennessee or in Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Florida, uh, South Carolina, you get into that phase one where, uh, to me, this is the easiest of all four. Now, turkey hunting is never easy. You know, it's not, the, it's not a guarantee. It's you're hunting a wild animal that's that's, uh, you know, he's a challenge. That's why we like to hunt him. But in this phase, I think the, it's, it's the easiest because the gobblers have been, you know, they've been doing their thing all winter long, fall. You know, turkeys are always turkeys. It's not like turkeys get up one day and say, okay, now we can start strutting and gobbling because it's spring. They're doing that right now. We have 10 inches of snow in my yard right now. And I guarantee you somewhere today, so, there was a turkey gobbling somewhere and strutting. Now they're not strutting and gobbling to attract a hen. This is all a pecking order. It happens all, even in the summertime, you go out there in June, July, 
And if you followed gobblers and groups of gobblers, you'd see them displaying, you'd see them fighting, because turkeys are always, uh, it's a pecking order with them all year long. How many times have you been deer hunting, you know, November, rifle season, uh, or bow hunting in October, and you look out and you see a group of gobblers and want to be strutting? Now, he's not out there strutting like he is in April, but it's, you know, there's always a boss hen, there's always a boss gobbler. So there is that instinct that kicks in, though, right around that March phase where they're like, oh, okay, now I'm strutting for a different reason. You know, there's that, uh, th they just know that that is there to breed. And there is no turkey, and you hear some of these guys talk about the unkillable turkey. There is no turkey that's unkillable. There is no turkey that's so smart and so wise and so mature that he's just forgot all about his instinct to breed. That's a lie. It's not true. He, he's receptive to breeding. You know, every year it's a cycle that they go through. So when you get into this first phase, and this is my opinion based on a lot of years of turkey hunting, they get, it, they get into that phase where, okay, now that instinct kicks in. Now, now. It's no longer about it's no longer about getting with the boys and you know uh, uh, grouped up like they are in fall or in the winter because your gobblers are grouped up most of the year if you think about it summer fall winter they're grouped up there's only one time of the year that they kind of get broke away and they fight you know and that's that's in the spring uh, as far as like for dominance over a hen so. This is kind of the easiest phase to call them because that instinct to, oh man, they've been, they've been ready all year for this. So what I like to do in this phase is this is where I really get vocal because you're not going to hurt anything. You've been, you know, th think about it. You're a hen, you're, you're, you're portraying yourself as a hen that's been pinned up, ready to breed. And he's the gobbler pinned up, ready to breed for a year. So, you know, de de depending on what you want to use, uh, you know, box, call, mouth call, slate call. Um, I'm, I'm more of a fan of a box call because I use mouth calls and slate calls too. But I like a box call, a good box call, because it's loud. It gets it gets out in them hills and hollers of Tennessee. It gets out in them hills and hollers where, you, where they can hear. And a lot of times, them gobblers that's been so pinned up, ready to do something, you know, with a hen, they're, you know, two, three-year-old gobbler, they're just so vocal. And you want to find in this first phase more vocal than what they will be later on. We'll talk about. So in this first phase, you get a lot of goblin, and and there's still you, you'll still find these groups of gobblers that's that's batched up. They they still haven't got broke away totally yet, like they will be in a few weeks from from then. You'll still find them group of gobblers that's maybe you might find three or four two-year-olds in a bunch, or two or three, you know, two or three four-year-olds are, are you know hanging together. So it's not uncommon to, to call in one, in one or more, or two, two or more gobblers in this phase, which is fine, you know, because a lot of times they get jealous of one another and they, they'll try to beat each other in. As far as the calling, I, I get loud, like I said, you know, this is where you really want to get, you know, a lot of, lot of yelps, you know, a lot of, lot of cuts. So you, you can you can basically just do anything you pretty much want to do uh, and get away with it. Now, that may change down the road. We'll talk about that. But right now, hey, you've been pinned up for a year. They've been pinned up for a year. Let's have some fun. That's what I say. The first phase is all about getting that call out there and getting that response back. And a lot of times, you, these are turkeys that's easy to call in. Not always. You're still going to have turkeys that's just being turkeys, but... I've seen I've seen a group of two or three gobblers just run in March first of April. They'll just come running into a call. Uh, if you like a mouth call, you, know, you can do a lot of yelps on a mouth call too. You know, just do a lot of that stuff. Locate a gobbler, and then once he gobbles and gets back, and he and he starts coming in. Of course, then you want to soften it down a little bit too and start turkey hunting the way you're supposed to turkey hunt. But it can be a blast. I love, out of all the four phases, phase one and phase four is my favorite. But phase one is that you've been pinned up all winter, you're ready to turkey hunt. So 
it's always it's always fun to get out, finally get out of the gate. But man, the goblin is insane. It's 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 not uncommon to hear seven, eight, nine turkeys on a morning just gobbling their heads off. So that's phase one. Oh, in phase one, um, I know sometimes you you run into days where they're not gobbling and and you just find sign and you you hunt a turkey yep. like you hunt a deer. Uh, sure. But in phase one, you're actively seeking a gobble because you think you can mm -hmm. strike one off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's this is where running running and gunning really comes in. If you got if you got the property, you know, say you're hunting public land or hunting a big piece of private, this is where you can really cover some ground and just go from point to point, ridge to ridge, and just start calling and get that and get that gobbler that's that's aggressive because, like I said, he's ready. And I mean if you want to tag out quick phase ones phase one's usually the phase to do it so i love phase one love it okay um are, do you do you find that any of these turkeys during phase one behave differently if they're if you're hunting a flat farm versus if you're hunting in the hills or big woods you know what i'm saying yeah no, not not really i mean you're, you're gonna have you're gonna have that debate and people are going to say well you know, uh, turkeys in Pennsylvania is going to be harder to kill than the turkeys in Kansas or vice versa, or whatever. And that's not really true. They're all turkeys. They're all turkeys with the same instinct. And, uh, you know, some of them but depend on pressure. That's pressure has got a lot to do with it. You know, a public land turkey, he may be a little bit harder to call, not because he's used to a hunter's call. We'll get to that a little bit later. He's not used to calling. They don't, they can't think that way. They're used, you know, it's used to pressure. Uh, you know, one, one story I can tell you about pressure is a guy, uh, I went to this property one time and, uh, man, these turkeys were gobbling their heads off. I mean, just gobbling, gobbling. I mean, and they were, they were hearing four or five turkeys in uh, on one hillside a morning. And after a couple of days of hunting there, I mean, it was like, you just shut everything down. Now, some people will look at that and say, well, it's because everybody got in there and, and, and called to them and they, and they didn't like the call. And that's not true. What they were doing, because I wasn't doing it because I was smart enough to know not to. But while you were hunting, well, I'd be on this side of the farm. On that side were two or three other guys. You hear four wheelers going through four wheeler trails. You'd see them walking through fields. You'd see them, you know, walking across the field, you know, big old ridges. And what, well, if them turkeys are up on them ridges, hillside, and they're looking down, what do you think they're seeing walking across that field? They're seeing a man, they're seeing danger, so it shuts them up. So a lot of guys go in there and they ruin these spots and then they'll blame it on turkeys or call shower. They'll blame it on turkeys or uh, knowing they're, you know, they just know that's a turkey call. It's not true. It's not true at all. Turkeys don't think that way. It's pressure. So I don't think turkeys are any different in say, uh, in uh, say Nebraska than they are in, in West Virginia, it's just pressure. But if you don't put as much pressure on turkeys and you hunt them smart, you have goblin turkeys all, all spring long in a lot of a lot of cases. That's why that's why you can talk to one guy in a sport goods store, and they'll say, "Man, they're just gobbling their heads off down there where we're at." Then, well, we ain't ever heard one up there where we're at. So you know, and be and be in the same same county, but it's just different pressure on on turkeys. So I guess, especially in the early season, it's key, just like if you're deer hunting, access to the property, knowing oh. that, that you're being seen and being careful on the way in is it, super important. Otherwise, you oh, can get the property out. A, at the very yeah, it, well, what's the first instinct that you have when you, uh, when you hear a turkey? The first instinct a hunter has is, you know, he'll be up there calling, you know. And he gobbles and what's the first instinct? We're gonna run to him. We just wanna to run to him, you know, go straight beeline to him. And a lot of times the access, just the access will wipe you out before you ever get started. And um, so sometimes I, the guys that hunt with me sometimes, they get aggravated because we'll hear four or five turkeys gobbling around us. And I'll just stand there like an idiot. I'll, I'll just keep standing there and they're just gobbling everywhere. And I'll, I'll just keep standing there and I'll go, well, what, what are we doing? I'm just listening. Well, let's go, man. This one's closer. This one, well, we get to this one, but he might not be the right turkey to go to because of the access. Or he might not be in, he might not be gobbling, you know, like this one that may be further down, 
you know, the ribs or whatever. So it pays to read turkeys. And, that, and, and that's the one thing I've always tried to teach people is read, learn how to read a gobbler's gobble. If you'll, if you'll listen real close and, and learn turkey behavior, a lot of times when you have multiple turkeys gobbling, you'll know exactly which one to go to or which one will be the easiest to call. Okay. So that's very important. And we have a question. Um, I guess you, we'll maybe take this in each in each stage of the season. But do you ever roost your birds uh, the night before in the first stage? When I can, you know. So, sometimes I just can't. Sometimes, you know. Sometimes I may be hunting 45, 50 minutes from the house uh, where I'm staying at, and it's just too hard sometimes to go all the way back out there. You know, like if you have a cutoff time, say like, you know, like in Missouri, it's one o'clock or in Virginia, the first, the first, the Virginia, the first three weeks of season or four, it's, it's 12 o'clock, Pennsylvania, it's cutoff time. A lot of these states have cutoff times where you can't hunt all day. So if you're, if you drive 45, 50 minutes all the way back to the house, not unless you're really, really dedicated, nothing wrong with it, but who's going to drive all the way back and then drive all the way back, you know, and, and do all this run, especially with gas going up like it is. So when I can, I do. And I think roosting's great. I think as long as you stay back and don't get in there where they're at, you know, don't, don't be pushing that area where you think they're going to be at. If you stay back and know the property, learn the property. And if you've hunted there historically and you kind of know every ridge and every crevice, you know, maybe it's a family farm or whatever, uh, I got one pla a couple of places back home in Virginia where I go, I mean, I, when the turkey gobbles in the evening, now I do go roost there because it's only five, five minutes from, you know, for, where my childhood home was, where I stay at. So when I hear a turkey, I can I'm about tell you what ridge he's on, what holler he's in, just because I've hunted there for so many years. But roosting is great. It's just some people just can't do it. You know? But if, if you can't do it, don't let that discourage you. Know where the sign's at, like you said. Sign is everything. And I think a lot of people in spring overlook that because they, most turkey hunters, and, 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 and I really believe this. And I think if I say anything tonight, this is one of the things you need to remember. Turkey hunting in the spring is judged by hunters by one thing, gobbling. If turkeys ain't gobbling, Everybody runs back to Walmart or the, or the restaurant or Hardee's or wherever they meet the hunters. Everybody goes and says, well, it's a bad season. It's a bad season. It's a bad season. Why is it a bad season? Because they're not gobbling. But you got to remember something. You don't judge a season by their gobbling. They're out there doing turkey things in the spring. Turkeys don't have to gobble to get a hint. That's why he struts. That's, you know, that's why he gets out in the, in the open place and displays. That's why he has them hens close to him in later phases as we go into. He doesn't have to gobble to attract the hen. Now, we like when he gobbles, and it helps us as hunters, but remember this. When he gobbles, he knows other predators knows where he's at, too. Now, they will gobble. I'm not saying, and I love them gobble mornings, but if you have a, if you have a if you have a, a season where they just ain't gobbling, whether it's re weather related, whether it's pressure related, whatever the case, people will automatically say it's a bad season, or turkeys just ain't doing right. Have you heard that one? Turkey just ain't doing right. Yeah, they are. They're doing right every year, every single year. That thing inside of them is doing right. What God made them to do. But the reason why we say that's because they're not gobbling. Well, so when, when people say, because I, I get this question a lot, well, what do you do when turkeys don't gobble? I go in there and hunt them. Yeah, but how, you know, uh, can you be successful? I kill turkeys all the time when they ain't gobbling. I don't know how many turkeys I've killed over the years that never said a word. I just go in there, know where they're at, you know, kind of know the sign, know, done all the scout, done all this. I set up in there, call, and they come in. They just never gobble. So when turkeys ain't gobbled, go in there, go in there and hunt them, kill them. Okay. Uh, we had a question of, number one, what is roosting a bird? And two, what is your technique to, to actually roost a bird? 
Roosting a bird is what we call putting in the bed. That's where he flies up. He flies up and, and you know, right before dark, he'll fly up in that tree. He'll be there about all night, unless something, you know, could be an hour or anything to blow him out of there in the middle of the night. Most of the time, he'll be there the next morning. So it helps the hunter know exactly what tree or what area he's in so he can get in there even earlier, like before daylight, set up. And he's got a better chance to get tight on that turkey. And a lot of times when he flies down on the ground, he can be in gun range or he can be close enough to you to where you can see him and work him in. It's a great tactic. It's wonderful, man. I mean, it's, it's great when you can do that. But like I said, not everybody can. But uh, that's what roosting a turkey is. Now, how you roost them, I don't like to get close to where, you know, like I don't, if, if I know that they're roosting in this area, I stay back at least 150, 200 yards. And I try to depend on my ears and I'll use alcohol, uh, you know, just get an old owl, a hoot tube. Uh, a crow call even in the in the uh, in the evening, but alcohol usually works better. And right before dark, you want to stay back. Just stay back at your truck. A lot of times, if you can pull up the edge of a field and you know that, or something like that, or maybe at the bottom of a holler, get out on the county road. If you can hunt there, and just uh, sit there and listen. Hoot on that tube, or if you don't if you don't know how to use a tube or you know, call, just sit there. On, I've sat on the I've. Been a lot of days when I I forgot my hoot tube or something, not have it with me, and just set up on the hood of the truck and let, just lay back against the windshield and just listen. And a lot of times they'll gobble on their own, and uh, you'll know about exactly where to start the next morning. Gotcha. So the first ten days, week and a half of of, of the season is is one of the best because they're they're on the prowl really. Yep. Uh, yep. So what is What's the transition like, and what is the second phase that you that you think you've seen? Phase two is where most turkey seasons start opening all across the country, um, unless you're up north, extreme north, up in New, New England area, and maybe up in there where their season opens don't open until the first of May. Phase two, I think, is around that April the tenth to about April the twenty third, right around uh, right around that area, and this is this is where most turkey seasons really are going strong. You know, everybody's out hunting pretty much across the country. So you got a lot of pressure. People's putting pressure on them, especially on public land. Um, but also in the turkey behavior pattern, here's what's happening. They're starting to get with hens now. They're starting to get with them first two or three hens, and they're starting to, you know, they're starting to do their thing. So turkeys with hen, gobblers with hens are a lot more difficult to kill than gobblers by themselves like they were in phase one. Because a lot of times in that phase one, you'll find gobblers by themselves that haven't, hasn't got with a hen yet. That's why a lot of, that's why a lot of states, uh, like Missouri, for instance, and a lot, of, a lot of other states, hunters complain because they say, well, our season just opens up too late. So we miss out, all, we miss out on all the good gobblers by themselves because by the, by, the, by the time most turkey seasons open you know before uh, on opening day you've got to deal with hemmed up gobblers but in phase two here's what i see now again this ain't this ain't 100 percent. i'm just saying over my 30 years here's what i've seen what i've seen is it's easier to call a gobbler away from a hen in this phase because he don't have maybe but one or two or three a lot of times and it just seems like he wants to get as many hens as possible because later on you're going to see him with seven, eight, nine, ten hens in a big, you know, populated area. So you're going to see him get more hens as the weeks progress. But right now he's only got one or two. Well, how long do you think it takes for him to breed one or two or three hens? Not very long. Now he may be with them hens, but if you're back here calling, now here's what I've seen. When you're back here calling, a lot of times you could call him away from them hens and get him come to you, or you can get that hen fired up and mad and she'll come to you and you and he'll and she'll bring him. And then if he's got hens, here's what I found a lot in phase two also. Give him about eight, not at about nine o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock in the day. And it seems like they start getting away from them hens because they don't have that many. So the less hens they've got, they're gonna lose them sooner. So they start getting by themselves a lot earlier, say like, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 o'clock up in the day. So if, if you don't, if, you, if you're not successful 
uh, say early, 7.30, 8, 9 o'clock, don't give up. Because if, as, even if you're not hearing nothing, because I've, I've seen a lot of days where you won't even put ears on a turkey until 11 o'clock. And 10, 30, 11 o'clock, it's just like you turn the light switch on, and I mean, they're just gobbling. Usually, if you get a turkey going at 9, 30, 10, 11 o'clock in the day, he wants to ride in your truck. Usually, he's pretty easy to call in. So, in phase two, they're starting to get hinned up, but it's not... It's not, it's not possible and it's doable to call them away from that hen. Now, how you call them away from a hen, a lot of times, here's what I like to do. If I see a gobbler hey, Matt, out there. When you, when you go to call, call a little softer, I think your, your, vol, your computer okay. is limiting your volume. Gotcha. I'll back away a little bit. Okay. But like, like if, if, if he's out there and I see him with hens, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get her attention. Because there's, remember what I said earlier, there's always a boss hen, there's always a boss gobbler. So if she's, if she's dominant, I'm going to try to get her attention first. And this is where you're going to really start laying some yelps on her, start cutting to her. Because when, when, when you cut to a hen, a lot of times when you're cutting to them, they know that hen's excited. Maybe she's aggravated, it's challenging. So you're trying to challenge that hen. So here's what I do. kind of challenge it now if i can see them hens and that gobbler sat in the field or down on a flat somewhere if i can if i can lay eyes on them i'll watch her a lot of times you you'll see that lead hen stick her head up and she's looking and if she starts coming back at you if, if you can get her to respond to you forget about gobbler hunting don't even worry about him let's just pretend he ain't even there even though that's hard <laughs> let's just act like he ain't even there we don't care about him right now if she's up there putting her head up and she's looking for you and then she, you know, she's back here, then you want to do the same thing she does. You want to, we're going to play a game of mockery here. So if she yelps, I'm going to yelp back at her. If she cuts, I'm going to cut back at her. If she, if she starts getting, you know, fired, I'm going to, and I'm going to call over her. I'm going to get more aggressive than her because that's the way you challenge. And I have actually seen hens turn and him, him not even gobble, him just back there strutting, having the time of his life, you know, just back there doing his thing. And I've seen her get so angry that she'll come 70, 80 yards to find me to whoop my tail. Well, if she comes to you, guess where he's going to come? He going to come to her. And I've, I've killed a lot of gobblers over the years just by calling, calling hens in. And, you know, and, and here he comes. Now, let's say she don't. Let's say she don't uh, pay no attention. Maybe she's not dominant or just maybe she don't care because, you know, turkeys being turkeys. Nothing's 100% in, in the game of hunting. Deer hunting, turkey hunting, waterfowl, whatever. Nothing is 100%. But let's say she don't pay no attention to you. Now I'm going to get on his turf because if he's down there strutting and got his little two or three hens with him, I'm going to challenge him. Now this is where gobbler yelping comes in i'm going to challenge him with gobbler yelps and a lot of people don't realize that gobblers i'm talking about full adult gobblers with beards and spurs they gobble or they'll, they'll yell just like a hen but it's a little bit different now when i start gobbler yelping and i'm up here 80 75 80 90 yards or whatever the case i'm going to gobbler yelp because i'm going to challenge him and I'm going to make him think there may be two or three other young jakes or, or another longbeard coming into his territory. So here's how you gobble you up. I'm going to do it on a box call. That's my favorite. That's my favorite way to gobble you up. You can do it on mouth call or, or slate call too, but it just seems like a box has got, it, it just really does it good. So uh, here's a hen yell. Here's the difference. Here's a hen yell. A little bit high pitched you know, uh, kind of faster paced. Be a little softer. Huh? Be a softer. little softer. Softer. Nope. Nope. 
All right, now go. Nope, too loud? Yeah, it's too loud. Let me go back here. Nope. It's coming in and out. It's all right. Let, 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 me, let me try the mouth call. So a hand yelp was a little bit more, you know, higher frequency, higher, you know, a little bit faster. Here's a gobbler yelp, slower. All you're doing is lengthening it out your yelps. It's all you're doing. It's not, it's not hard. Any idiot can do it. If I can do it, I'm an idiot. Anybody can do it. So <laughs> you're just lengthening it out your yelp. Now, now this is when I can, I know the gobbler's down there with hens. Maybe I can see him. Maybe I can't, but I know he's there. Maybe I hear him down there gobbling every once in a while, not, but, but I hear them too. Or, you know, a lot of times I, I like to be able to look at them and see them. I, I'm going to challenge him, so I'm going to start gobbler yelping. And all you're doing is just longer, more deeper, raspier yelps like this. Maybe put some Jake yelps in there. Sure. You put them little Jake yelps and, and, and the adult gobbler yelps in. And I have seen, I've seen it. It's not 100%. Like I said, nothing works 100%. But I've seen gobblers with hens actually leave them hens and come up 50, 60, 70 yards, get away from them hens, you know, head turned blood red looking to fight and kill him. Now this is kind of what happens in phase two. Or phase two, like I said, you're gonna find them, you're gonna find them separate from them hens up in the daytime so they get a little bit easier to call in. Now you may not, you, you, you can still call, you know, I still call pretty aggressively in in the phase two i still get pretty loud i may not cover as much ground because again they're with hens so you've got more than one set of eyes looking out through there so i'm i'm taking it a little bit slower maybe than i was maybe three or four weeks in phase one but i'm still covering pretty good ground looking for them turkeys that'll gobble if i don't have no success early with them uh i may go try to find another turkey that's by itself and if i can't i'll circle back around I remember where that turkey was with hens. I'll circle back around, say 9.30, 10 o'clock and hunt him again. A lot of times you'll call him right in without hens. So that's phase two. And phase two it can be really productive. I got a, uh, a couple of questions. Um, number one, I know, I know uh, on your videos, you hunt a lot of wood, wood turkeys. You know, you, yeah. you got fields and you got, you got forest turkeys, you know, like I, mm -hmm. like I hunt. Um, What's the, is there a difference in, in how you hunt those uh, turkeys? Definitely. Field turkeys are, field turkeys can be very hard because you can't move. I like to hunt, I like to hunt timber. If you give me a, if you give me a choice, timber or field, I'll take a timber every time. I don't think there's nothing prettier than a gobbler strutting up through the hardwoods. Uh, not saying they're not pretty in the field too, but man, you call a gobbler up through the hardwoods, what, uh, and it's just, it, they're just something special about it. Now, field turkeys, sometimes you got to hunt them. If you live in Kansas, some parts of Western Tennessee where they got a lot of agricultural, say like East Tennessee, where I'm kind of from, Eastern Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, you get a lot of mountains. You don't have a lot of fields. You go to West Tennessee and you got more uh, farmland. And, and, and so some, some people just have to hunt fields. And if the turkeys are in the field, then I'm going to hunt. I'm going to hunt where they're at. I'm not going to be back here on this ridge and be and just be stubborn and say, "Well, I just hunt field. I just hunt timber turkey." No, if they're gobbling down there, and that's where they're at. That's where I'm going. Field turkeys can be very difficult because you can't move. It, you can't set up a lot of times the way you want to set up, say as as in the timber. If you're going to hunt fields, you got two choices. You can do what a lot of guys like to do and pop up a ground blind, and just sit, wait for them. I don't like to do that personally. If that's what you like to do, that's more power to you. I know some people have to, 
because they're just disabled or maybe they can't walk, you know, if they got leg problems or whatever, so they, they don't like to move around. So getting in the blind and sitting, but you want to get in the, you want to get in the parts of the, the field where the heavily, the most heavily used sign is. So you want to, you want to scout them field edges and find where them turkeys are coming in because there's always going to be corners where they're using more than others. And you want, you want to hunt them corners and put your blind up and sit there. And, um, that's kind of one way to hunt a field. Now, if I, now, since I don't hunt out of pop-up blinds, unless it's raining, uh, and since I'm not that kind of hunter, if, if I'm moving and I hear a turkey in the field and I got to get to him, I'm going to try every way in the world to crawl and, and slide myself where I think I'm in the best position to call him down that, to call him down that field. The problem is, remember, turkeys, you, you see, what makes turkey, what makes spring hunting such uh, such a challenge and we'll be doing one of these webinars we'll we'll do one on beginner turkey hunting too but for those that may be listening to this that this is your first year maybe you you hunted a couple years what makes turkey hunting such a challenge in the spring is you're trying to reverse nature in nature the hen usually goes to the gobbler that's why he gobbles he's up here gobbling telling her hey you come here and then she hears, and she's ready to breed, she goes to him. You're trying to reverse it. You're back here sounding like a girlfriend. He's gobbling back at you saying, hey, honey, you come over here where I'm at. And you're trying to make him come to you. That's what's a challenge, and that's why they kick our tails 95% of the time. But that's why we enjoy hunting. Uh, if it was easy, we, we, you know, it, it, just wouldn't be, it just wouldn't be much worth going. So... I want to get as close as I can without calling. If I see a turkey, you know, I'm using binoculars, my scope, my shotgun. If I'm, if I see a turkey out in the field and he's like, let's say he's 300 yards, 200 yards away, or whatever, maybe 150 yards, and I'm back here and I can spot him. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go up at, I'm not going to go back here and start crawling and calling at the same time because when you call, what's he going to do? He's going to look in your direction. You don't want him looking in your direction. Let him just let him be out there. Let him feed. Let him pick around. Let him do what, strut, whatever he's doing. You want to do it, whatever you got to do. Use the terrain. You want to get as close to him as possible without making one sound. Once you get as close as you think you can get, then you want to start calling. Field turkeys can be aggravating because you'll see them out there and it's sometimes they'll act like they ain't pay attention to you and you'll be like, man, this is, this ain't going to work. And then all of a sudden he'll turn to come right to you and you not be ready for him. So it, both can be successful. Both can be great, but I'd like to hunt timber turkeys just because you can move around and you can slip easier. Do you find any, say, tall grass fields versus short grass fields, do you find a difference in <clears throat> the attractiveness to a turkey? Yeah, I don't, I don't think they like that. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, first, I don't think they like that tall grass as much as they would a short grass because they can't see. Now, that's not saying they won't go in tall grass if they have to, but they want to get to where they can see danger. So if I, if I have to choose between tall grass and short grass, I'm going to go to short grass. Because you remember, he's got wings. He can fly. <laughs> and, and when he's in that tall grass, a lot of the times it cuts down their, it cuts down their, their, survival uh but that ain't every time i've seen them go right and stuff as chest high and disappear it just depends you know uh, it really just depends on the turkey's mood and what he wants but generally speaking short grass is always going to be better because plus he can pick around grasshoppers and insects and stuff so um we talked about fields if you were going to try and call a turkey in or find them in the in in timber you would you would treat it like a deer hunt you would go to sign and unless you roosted the bird you would go to sign and then you would try and call one in from there or locate one close to where where that sign yeah if i go on a new property and now sometimes you know we're, we're maybe your schedule where I, like you know like myself i don't get the chance to scout a piece of property because i'm usually going to a place on Friday night and getting ready to hunt Saturday. But what I'll do when I get on that new place, I'm using my ears. I'll get up high 
I usually like to get up high on a ridge or something where I can hear and find out what the turkeys are doing if they're gobbling. But if they ain't gobbling, then I'm going to start not looking around so much. I'm going to be looking down just like your deer. I'm going to be looking for sign as I'm moving along our calling. I'm going to be looking down and if there's no turkey sign there, you're wasting your time. Just like deer hunt. Why would you go, why would you go deer hunt a place where there's not a deer track? Sign will never lie to you. Fresh sign, old sign will lie to you, but fresh sign. And if you've hunted any amount of time, even a, a novice will know what fresh sign looks like. You know, black dirt where they've scratched, fresh, you know, fresh uh, looking feathers that's from a roost site. Uh, fresh droppings, you know, like you, you just look and you see turkey droppings that's very fresh, just like you're deer hunting. That's not going to lie to you. They're there. They may not be goblin, but I guarantee you something. They were there that day. They're going to be in there probably, the, you know, the next couple of days. Seems to me like turkeys just kind of make a circle for, you know, for a couple of days. They, they stay in kind of like a circle. Now, they may move you know, three or four days, especially if they get a hen, she may take him off to another property or whatever the case. But it seems like turkeys just do this. It just seems like they kind of go in a circle and they don't go very far. So if I start seeing fresh sign, I'll get in there the next day and start hunting over that sign. So it's important to get up high and listen. Use your ears, of course, because they're not going to lie to you. But if they're not gobbling, like you said, you're going to find them days when they're not gobbling. You start looking on the ground. I don't care what's going on around me. I mean, I don't care. I'm looking on the ground and trying to find what's going on. If if you were able to come down here to Tennessee, um, and I told you there was a farm that, that we got, you know, permission on, you can hunt. Um, what is there any type of pre-scouting you would do before you ever set foot on the property, or do you think, you know, just get me on the property, I'll sort it out when I get there? How would you go about doing it? <laughs> If I live there, and uh, say if, it, it depends, because if, if I'm a non-resident, I probably ain't got time to scout, especially if turkey season's open. If I live there, and let's say turkey season not open until the last week of March, and somebody calls me uh, next week and says, hey, man, I got a new piece of property, you can turkey hunt. I'm going to be in there ASAP looking and seeing what's going on. You know, I'm going to be in there looking because I don't want to be in there putting a lot of pressure on right before season starts anyway. I'm going to be in there right now looking around. I'm going to be in there right now looking where scratching. You say, well, they might change that. Well, they might, but historically, where they're at last year or where they was at the year before, they'll probably be in that same area again if nobody blows them out of there. So uh, Scouting is very important. I wish I could scout. I'd kill a lot more turkeys if I could scout places where I hunt. But a lot of times when you travel and hunt, you got to hunt and scout at the same time. Okay. Is there – the question um, Brandon asked, it, do you do any satellite imagery scouting, like on X maps before you yeah. get on there? Or how do you go about doing any of that? Definitely. What I look for is if I have – if. Uh, if, if I have a place that I haven't been to and whoever invites me will send me the property, I'll start looking on Onyx maps from the sky just to see what it's kind of like. See if there, you know, there's a field here, there's a little pasture here, this is a hardwood ridge here, you know, there's this uh, neighbor's property, you know, here. So if let's say I'm hunting a property and it's all woods, let's say it's all timber and I say, let's say there's 70 acres and I've got permission to hunt on 70 acres. Now this ain't all the time. I'm just giving you a general idea. But let's say I get 70 acres to hunt and it's, and it's, it's a small piece of property, but it's full of turkeys, but it's all timber. But let's say that on this 70 acres, right on the fence line, because on X will tell you what, what the property ends and who owns it right on the fence line, there's a big old cornfield or there's a big old hay field, or wheat field or some kind of food source. If there's nothing up here much and it's all woods and it's, and well, guess where I'm going to start? I'm not going to start up here. I'm probably going to, the first day I walk in there, I'm going to start probably on the fence line somewhere close to that to find out if the turkeys are coming from up high down to that field, right? Now they may not, they may be back up on the ridge. I may have to, 
change, change to go where they're going. But I'm going to I'm going to start because they got food source turkeys all day long. Remember, turkeys fly down, get with hens. They eat, they poop, they walk around, they gobble, they strut, they fly back up, call tonight. That's the life of a turkey. It's not like they're sitting up there going, oh, there's a hunter down there. Let's all hide. You know, it's, no, they're just, they're just doing turkey things. So when I go to public land, if I'm hunting public land, I'll tell you what I do, and most, and most guys do this. They may not tell you, but this is what they do. They'll find the private property that joins that public because they know the turkeys are not pressured on that pub, uh, private and they'll try to call them across a lot of times or the turkeys will roost on public and and and, and go over to private in the fields and stuff so if, if, if you just happen to hunt public hunt the fence lines hunt the hunt find, find you a piece of public that's got a lot of food source surrounded on private stay on you know don't get over on them but stay on public and hunt them fence lines you'll be amazed at the turkeys that you'll hear right close to them fence lines and before they get over you can call them in to kill them good deal before we get into to phase three we got one more question um which is a pretty good question i've always wondered this because uh sometimes i feel like i'm just walking around the woods gobbling every 15 minutes how often do you if you're hunting and you're trying to locate a gobbler you're walking like you said these ridges how often do you call? Do you wait till you get to the end of the ridge and then call, or what do you do? It it depends on where I'm at. Depends on the it depends on the terrain. It depends on uh, it, every situation is different. If I if I'm hunting, say, East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, West Virginia, some of the very hilly, uh, hard timber stuff, I used to go probably about a hundred yards. I'll call and then, you know, I'll walk maybe 75, 100 yards and stop, call again. Um, I'll usually, too, now let's say you're hunting a logging road situation. You know, a lot of times you have old strip jobs in, in uh, world, you know, the mines and stuff and, and strip jobs. Or you have a place where they've logged and you got a lot of logging roads through there. But turkeys love logging roads. Well, before I go around the corner of a logging road, I'm going to call. I'm going to call before, before I before I go around the corner where I can't see. I'm going to call. A lot of times that that, that in the ridge, if I'm on a ridge and it starts dropping off into a holler, I'm going to call. I, first of all, I don't try to walk on the ridge top. I don't try to walk directly on the ridge. I like to get on the bench. I don't like to be skyline because if they're down here, they're looking up. They see you know. So I try to stay right under that ridge and, and walk the bench instead of walking on 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 top the ridge. And sometimes you got to walk the ridge because of maybe brush or, or thorny or whatever the case. So it's not all the time, but I, that's what I try to do. Uh, if, before I enter into a field, if, if there's a field out there and I see it breaking off, I'm going to call before I get into that field. You never know. There's been a lot of times where I didn't call. I blowed a turkey because I was like, oh, man, what? You know, if I'd have just called him, may have gone and let me know he was there. But because I thought I could get away with it, I just – went through there without calling and, and, and bloating. So anytime that you have a change in your sight, you know, where you can't see, yeah, it, it, it might pay just to give a, you know, give a call. But listen, calling, uh, there's some guys that are just, they're terrified of calling. I, I really, I've seen this because in their head, they get this, I'm calling too much. Now it's true. You can call, you can overcall to a gobble. We've talked about it. You can overcall to a gobble when you're working him in. But listen, turkeys are out there calling every day. You're not going to call too much trying, you know, every 100 yards or so. That's what turkeys do all the day. That's what they're used to listening to every day all year long. Turkeys are yelping spring, summer, fall, winter. Right now today, 10 inches of snow out there, there was a hen out there yelping and a gobble heard her. Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere there was a jake yelping and a gobble heard that. You're not going to you're not going to mess up, but some guys. Oh, I'm just afraid if I call, it's going to they're going to know that that's a turkey call. Unless you sound god awful terrible, and they know it's not natural, you're not going to mess nothing up. But I've I've actually seen guys just go all to pieces because it's almost like oh I'm afraid to call. You know, 
man, that's what you're out there doing. You've got to get aggressive and you've got to call. Now, you can overcall, of course, when you're working him in. That's true. We get on that some other time. But if I'm trying to locate a gobbler, <laughs> I'm going to shake the trees. I'm going to shake the trees until I, until I get one going, you know, because he's got to hear you before he responds to you. You've got uh, on your YouTube channel, you've got a lot of videos about how to start. If, if you don't know, for everybody on the on – the, um, workshop here if you don't know how to call and you want to learn matt's got a lot of videos on his youtube channel with just how to start out calling if you he's got a video on how to start out mouth calling how to use a box call how to use a slate call to me if two of the easiest ways to start turkey hunting is to get a slate call and get a box call if you can get a slate whether you're very good at a uh at a, a mouth call or not, you can absolutely learn how to purr to a turkey. A box call, you can locate them very well, and you can purr with that thing. You can cut, and you can you can do about anything you want to do on a box call. Um, and he's got excellent video showing that. Um, it's tough tonight because because the sound is is yeah. tough. When a guy when when somebody asked me if you had one call you had to choose, most people most people think you're going to say a mouth call. Now, that, I think every, every turkey hunter needs to learn how to mouth call, at least a little bit, because it frees your hands up when that turkey's coming in. But listen, if you have to just buy one call, you're that poor that you can only afford one turkey call, and, you're, you know, and, you're, and you've never been turkey hunting, or maybe you're just starting to get a box call. I would take it over a slate call because, one, it's all one piece. You're not going to lose nothing with this. You could lose the striker, fall out of your vest, or whatever the case, you know, and, and then you won't be without a call. A box call, it's just so easy. And not, not just because it's easy, but I know a lot of times people don't like a box call because they're hearing it close up. You know, they're, they're hearing it, you know, and they hear the wood scratching and all this stuff. But, I, but think about this. A turkey is not hearing what you're hearing. They're out there 75, 80, 100, 200 yards. You take a good box call like this one. This is mine from Spring Beaver, my signature series. You take a good high quality call, a, a good high quality call. You, you, you take a video camera or you take your buddy and go back and let him tape you, tell him to go 100 yards and stand, and you call with a slate call and a mouth call and a box call. You go back and listen to the difference. A box call sounds so real. You listen to hens 75, 80, 100 yards, you listen to a box call 75. It is amazing the realism that a box call sounds out there where a turkey hears it. Now, it's true. Once a, tur once a turkey gets up close, you want to switch to something, maybe a slate call or something like that where you can purr, you know, good and get them, get them a little soft, get that little soft stuff or, or a mouth call because it frees your hands up. So, but people ask me all the time, man, why do you like a box call so much? My Lord, man, it's because they work. <laughs> they work so good. So. Yeah. Well, we went through first and the second stages. I guess third stage is, is what you would consider one of the hardest stages because uh, we get what we call hand up turkeys, right? Phase three, I would say, is the hardest of all four phases. I dread, I mean, I love turkey hunting. I'll turkey hunt every day of the season. But I dread when this phase comes because I, I can tell you two things that's going to happen. One, turkey's going to be hard. And two, I'm going to get probably, and not exaggerating, I'll get 70 to 80, 100 messages a year on social media, private messages saying, what happened to the turkey? Something happened. Why ain't the turkeys gobble? So every year, the last week of, uh, toward the last part of April, first week of May, I will get swamped with the same, same questions. What happened to the turkeys? They ain't gobbling. They'll gobble on the roost. They'll hit the ground and nothing. Now we've all been there. You've been there. I've been there. They'll gobble their brains out on the roost. They hit the ground. It's over. Is it over? No. But remember what I said, we judge turkey hunting by their gobbling. If you judge it by the goblin, boy, you're ready to go back to Hardy's by 7, 30, 8 o'clock. Say, well, it's just done. It's just over. 
it's hard because phase three is where they're the most hemmed up. Turkey season's full blast, so they've been pressured, four wheelers, guys walking across the fields. They've been they've been shot at. They've been you know, and now they got all these hens. Now you're going to see gobblers with five, six, seven, eight hens at times. I've seen them as high as seven, eight. In fact, I take the gobbler last year. One gobbler out there, I shot him two days later, but um, uh, it was during this phase too. It's April the twenty fourth. Um, he had two days before he had I think seven hens with him. I got on camera. Seven hens with him two days before on the twenty second. I shot him on the twenty fourth. He was by himself. So, <laughs> so uh, it's a tough phase. They don't gobble much. Now it's not saying they won't. You're going to find that crazy turkey, that crazy two or three year old that just is crazy. But for the most part, this is where all the gobbling just kind of goes quiet. They're still there though. They're still there. They're still doing turkey things. They're still breeding. They're still strutting. They're still. So in this, I would say this is April the 23rd to about May the 4th or 5th, right around that time. This is the toughest phase. Goblin gets less. Now what you got to do is go back to scouting. You got to go back to where the turkey signs at. Now I'm going to say something right now, and we're going to talk about this on, on, on another one. We're going to talk about fall tactics for spring longbeards. But if you're a fall turkey hunter, you hunt them in the fall, a good, a good fall hunter will make a great spring hunter. Always remember that. A good fall turkey hunter will make a great spring hunter. Why? Because a fall hunter don't depend on his goblin to kill him. A guy that goes out every fall and fills a turkey tag on a longbeard gobbler he will be an outstanding spring hunter because he's learned how to hunt turkeys when they're not gobbling, when they're not doing what they're supposed to do in the spring. He depends on sign. He depends on another type of turkey hunting. Now, that's not saying turkeys won't gobble in this phase. I've called them in gobbling their heads off. But for the most part, you're going to find it a lot tougher because gobblers are just hinned up. Every once in a while, you'll find them hen. And the reason why I say every once in a while, it seems in this phase they're with hens all day long because they've got seven or eight of them that they're just jumping from one to another. We're in phase two, they may have one or two or, you know, one or two or three. And so they leave them quicker. Now they got more girlfriends. So they just jump one, 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 and they're just jumping. So they don't have to, they don't have to, it's just like a buck in the rut, you know, a big, a big mature buck when when the when 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 the rut's going on in in middle of November or, or, or wherever you hunt, what happens? He gets locked down with her. You were seeing all these big bucks the first week of November, last part of October. Now it's just like they all vanish. No, they didn't vanish. They're just locked down. Doe beds down. He beds down. Doe don't go nowhere. He don't go nowhere. Same thing with turkeys. Hens are out doing their thing. He's right with them, but he just goes from one to the other. So he just ain't by himself as much. That's what makes him harder to hunt because he's not gobbling as much because he don't have to gobble because he's already got what he wants. Now, sometimes you will find a lonely two-year-old, lonely three-year-old that's been whooped, you know, subordinate gobbler that's gobbling his head off. Sometimes you're going to find uh, maybe a, a, a turkey that's a coyote's pushed him off from his hens. Maybe, you know, because you're not the only one hunting these turkeys. Maybe he's been down there with the field and the coyote comes through before you got there and pushed him. He went this way and they went that way and he's by himself. So you, you still want to be out there hunting because you never know when you're going to find one by theirself. I'm just saying for the most part, this is why you don't hear as much goblin in this phase because they're just hinned up. Now, if you see them out there with hens, go back to what I said in phase two. If they're with hens, try to, try to get that dominant hen fired up. Try to hunt her. You hunt her and you get her to come, he's going to follow you. Or challenge him with gobble yelping. Try to get him to come. But just remember, this is a tough, tough phase because he's just got what he wants from the time he flies down. See, when he's up there in the tree, here's what, here, he, he, you got to learn turkey behavior. When he's up there in the tree at daylight and he's gobbling and he's gobbling six, you know, 60, 70 times, and you're thinking, man, you know, whoo, this is going to be done. He's answering me back. Yeah, he's answering you back because he, he wants you to be the eighth or ninth hen he's got to come into his harem. They fly down. He flies down with them. He shuts up. Why is he shut up? 
he don't have to gobble. He's already got what he wants. This is where roosting comes in. If you can roost them, get very tight on him, get, get really tight into that turkey before daylight. A lot of times you can kill him when he hits the ground, but it's tough. Phase three is, I dread it. I dread it every year, but I've killed them in phase three and, and uh, it, can, it can be successful. But I always said this, if you kill a turkey in this phase, put an extra feather in your hat because it can be tough. Gotcha. All right, so um, the first phase was, you know, uh, the end of March, March 24th through April 8th, somewhere right in there. Yeah. And that is where the, you would say that's kind of like the seeking phase. They're seeking. No. Sure. And then the uh, the second phase, you got around April 8th to what what date, do you think? Uh, April 8th, about April 23rd, probably 22nd, somewhere around in there, uh, just depending on where you're at. But usually most parts of the country. And that's when, that's when the gobblers, they have two, maybe three hens. And they start can, getting hinned up. They're still callable. Uh, yeah. it, it's starting to get the later in that cycle you get, the harder it gets. The harder it's going to get, yeah. And so then, don't don't freak out when you don't hear them gobbling because it's just turkey behavior. Yeah, and then we get to the third phase, and that's April twenty third or thereabouts. To what do you what do you think? That uh, first week of May, first you know third, fourth, fifth, sixth of May just depends. Uh, but uh, it, that's where it just all shuts down. It just all shuts down, it seems like. Gotcha. The, fourth, the fourth phase is the, it all changes. All right. So. And what, what would you call the fourth phase? And is it a reseeking phase? Is they all bred? Yep. In? yep. The phase four is where I have taken the largest gobblers of my life. Now, I actually killed the heaviest gobbler. The heaviest gobbler I ever shot was 27, a 27-pounder 27 I got in Oklahoma. I killed him in phase three. Uh, I killed him in phase three. But I have taken my biggest spurred turkeys and my biggest, my biggest turkeys as far as beard and weight are, are, are spurs, my older turkeys, I should say. I've killed them in phase four. Phase four is where you can kill some of the biggest turkeys of the whole year. I would say this phase is right around May the 8th, 9th, all the way till the end of season. You know, some, 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 some places it's, you know, May the 30th are uh, whenever your season ends. I'd just say from, the, from, from 7th, 8th of May all the way to closing the turkey season. This is what we call the late season. This is a blast. I have, I love, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of sad because turkey season is getting ready to close. So you're, you're kind of sad that, you, you know, the finish, the finish line's in sight. You're kind of sad about it. But, boy, it also can be great because the, the goblin increases. They start gobbling up in the day more. And they just seem like they just respond to a call board. And so it's almost like a reset of, of phase one. It's just that it's older turkeys. It just seems like it's older turkeys that's doing it. Where, where in phase one, you might have a lot of two, three-year-olds that's just experiencing their first spring as an adult. If you think about a two-year-old, one of the reasons why people say them crazy two-year-olds is gobbling like crazy. A two-year-old will usually gobble a lot more just because this is his first a spring in the, in, the, in the breeding ritual as an adult. Now he probably, you know, he could do stuff as a jake, but he just probably got whooped off enough by, by an older gobbler, so he didn't get a chance to really have his teenage experience <laughs> as much. Now he's an adult, so now he's got some weapons. He's got spurs, and he's got a little bit heavier weight. Now he's getting to participate in a, in a, in a, in a way that he's never got to before. And so he just really gets gobbling, and they got that full gobble. So that's where you get like phase one. Now in phase four, it's like now you start seeing the, fa the, the big gobblers, the mature gobblers, the th four or five-year-old turkeys with inch and a half spurs. That's where they just get really vocal. Whereas two or three weeks ago, they wouldn't even say a peep hardly. Now they're just, they're just gobbling. And that's when you hear them, oh, row, 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 them big old deep gobbles. And you're like, whoo, man, 
boy, that, that's an old sly right there. And, uh, you know, the turkey that I'm kind of famous for, the one I've named all my calls after, old sly, he was a 24 pound inch over, over inch and a half spurs, tw uh, 12 and a half inch beard turkey, a monarch. He was probably a five or six year old turkey I killed right in the mountains of Southwest Virginia where they don't get 24 pounds very much. You know, you get a 24 pound turkey out here in Missouri, it's like, ah, yeah, it's all right. You get one down in the, in the, in the sticks and the boonies in the mountains and the timber, you got, you got something special. And uh, I, I, killed, I killed this turkey on the 17th of May. So it was right in phase four. And he just gobbled his head off and he just came like they were supposed to. But I hunted him all season. And I knew him by his gobble because he had a unique gobble. That's how I knew him. I, I give him the name Old Sly, and I don't name stuff. I named that one because I called him in six times. Uh, in the, I, I called him in six times the whole season. It, within gun range, I couldn't kill him. He slid by me every time. That's why I called him Old Sly because I called him six different times, phase one, phase, phase two, phase three. Phase, I called him in different times and could not and just couldn't shoot him. And something always would go wrong. He'd always be here, 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 and, and he'd always slide by me without getting shot. And uh, but where you wouldn't even hear that turkey say a week or uh, two or three weeks before, you couldn't even get a peep out of it because I hadn't heard him in like two or three weeks. That morning I killed him, man. He was just like a two-year-old on steroids. You know, he was just gobbling his head off, and he was. But it was the seventeenth of May. He was all. He's all ready to go because he lost his hens. So it just, it just gets easier. Now in this phase, what I try to do is I'm not going to be calling this loud because you got to remember they've been here. They've been here calling. They've been, they've been called at, shot at and everything for, for a couple months now, a month. So I'm going to tone, I'm, I'm not, I'll still locate, you know, I'll still go on a ridge and get on a call. But if I don't hear nothing, I'm going to get them hollers, I'm going to get them points, and I'm going to start soft calling a lot more than, say, I would in phase two or one where I was really rocking the trees. So I'm going to tone everything down. This is where you, this is where everyone of you watching needs to learn how to soft call the correct way. And uh, soft calling is just, just like the name. You know, you're just softening everything down. Where, where a month ago you were just really getting on that call. Now you want to just tone everything. I call it under your breath calling. Stuff like this. This probably won't be as loud. So. I'll go set up somewhere in phase four. If I if I haven't heard nothing, I'll go set up in where I've where I've seen signs. Scouting, you know, scouting is important as always. So get in there and start soft calling like that. Clucks, purrs, two or three note yelps. You know, like instead of them long, no, no, yelp, yelp, yelp. You know, yelp. Just do stuff like this. Just that stuff like that. And a lot of times them gobblers will just, they'll gobble right on top of you and they were coming in the whole time. You just didn't know it and he'll gobble. And you'll kill, I mean, he'll be right in your lap in, in, in hardly no time, just soft call. Now that's not every time, you know, some turkeys are crazy. I'm just gonna let the turkey tell me what he wants. If, if, if I got a turkey out there and he's, he's responding to loud calling, more aggressive calling. That's what I'm going to do. I let every turkey tell me what he wants. But generally, talk. I'm just generally speaking. What I do every day is I'm going to soft call a lot more. Now you're going to find that one turkey that's just cuckoo, and you got to do something different. But you want to soft call and get get in them places where you know turkeys like to stay. Generally, if, if say if you got if you hunt if if you hunt like you hunt a place like back home I've got a place where it's it, it's a point that comes into a flat it's in the woods and it's a it's a big point that comes down it breaks off into a little shelf and a flat every year now they won't be in there early they, they, you, you'll, you'll hardly never kill it kill a turkey in there like in phase one phase two but it seems like in that late season phase four 
phase three, even phase four, seems like turkeys will just a gobbler will stay in there. And I, and I'll get in there, and a lot of times I've soft called, never hear nothing. Start soft calling, he'll he'll gobble hundred yards down in front of me, and then I'll just start working him and, and kill him. So go to known spots where you've seen turkeys, and go to known spots where you know turkeys are generally at. Just sit in there and look for them and soft call. So I'm going to tone it down, but man, the goblin is insane. You're going to hear a lot more goblin in phase four than say you did in phase three because they're getting away from their hens. The hens are starting to go to nest because you know they got a nest. That's the thing. They got to nest. It's in their DNA. They're going to do it. So they fly down. They get with the gobbler, whatever. You know, they feed around, and then she's going to go, she gonna, she gonna go lay on them eggs. She goes, lays on them eggs. Guess what? He's by himself. And he's going to look for another girlfriend. So it can just get great. Man, I've killed so many turkeys. I would say probably kill rate, kill, kill rate, I say, over the, over, over the years. I've killed a lot in phase one. But I would probably say I've killed more turkeys in phase four than I have any other phase. Probably of all of them. Gotcha. If... Um... Say you're you're walking through the the timber, and you're calling every hundred yards. At what point do you say, you know what, I'm not going to strike one. I just need to go to sign. I need to set up and and let's spend the day hunting these turkeys like I would hunt a deer. Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I guess if I if 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 I know the area and I know that I've walked most of it, or if I know I've walked say half of it. Let's just say it's like a hundred acres. Well, I'm not going to be out there walking a whole hundred acres, you know, because hundred acres ain't that much. But probably if I cover, say, where I think a turkey within earshot should be able to hear me, you know, it may be just 50 yards or whatever. It just depends on how flat it is. Or if I've walked up some hills, but and I just ain't, I ain't heard nothing, and I, and I just know. Yeah, any turkey should have heard me. Then I'm going to probably start hunting over the sign. Because, you know, you may be hunting over sign and just be hunting there, uh, you know, deer hunting them, as we call, uh, I'll call it. Just be sitting there watching. And then all of a sudden, one gets where you just came from. An hour later, he may be about right back up there gobbling. I've done that many times. Be up there calling, doing all that calling. But it took him, you know, it may, he may just moved in there. Or it may just took him a while to get to you. And he's just gobbling his head off. And he's behind you where you just came from. Or he's over here, or maybe you'll get one over here that just walked that's just moved into the area and now he's looking for a hen. So and if you're in there in that sign, then a lot of times he'll start gobbling when he knows, hey, you know, these hens were in here because he knows that sign was there. he knows where them hens was at. So a lot of times he'll just gobble and say, Hey, is anybody out here? You know. And uh you want to be set up in them areas. So and it depends on it depends on the property and how much room I got to run on. If I've got a lot of room to run on, you know, I, I know I hunted a place in South Carolina a couple of years ago. Uh, it's two thousand acres, and we just pretty much stayed in a in, in a in a buggy and and just run the roads <laughs> until we got one going. You know, we just we just so. But a lot of people can't do that. Most people in Tennessee, I guarantee you, hunt unless they hunt public land, most private property Tennesseans hunt 150 acres or less. So you just can't, you, you, you know, you don't want to be in there walking through there all the time. But I, I just try to say, well, if anything was in here, he should have heard me. Okay. Um, one of the questions we had is, is really, a, it's a sign question, really, uh, and I guess an experience question. In your experience, is there a particular tree that that turkeys love to roost, or is like I've found, is there a place that they love to roost? I, I found that they like to roost over these ridges, especially where the water is coming down the ridge. They like to roost over that. And um, is there are there particular roost trees that they like? They sure do. You, uh, actually. Where, where I live at right now, uh, it's just a quick story. Where I live at right now, long before I moved out here, I used to come out here to Missouri every year and turkey hunt. Well, we can't hunt there no more. They, there's a subdivision now, but right across the road, 
that this ridge that's right across the road from my house, we used to turkey hunt that. It was probably one of the best places in Northeast Missouri to hunt right across the road. And it was only 80 acres. It was 80 acres of a, of a ridge top. And that was it. I mean, it's a small little plate, but me and my dad both, I can't count the gobblers that we've killed off this one ridge top over the years since the, since the mid nineties, all the way till, till they built, till they sold it and they built the subdivision. In fact, right back, right here, there's a, there just over this ridge, uh, there's a house built and there's a big ground pool somebody put. And in that pool where that pool's at, I've shot probably seven or eight gobblers where that pool is actually at right now. So it shows you, shows you what man's done to turkey habitat. But, uh, there was one tree over here, and every single year, I, it didn't matter, every single year you would hear a gobbler in that tree. I, and, and I mean, it just was crazy. And sometimes when they wasn't gobbling, you could go to that, what we called the roost tree. You would go in there and sneak in there, and at daylight look up in there and hear him spitting and drumming and, 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 see, and see one up in that tree, and he never would gobble. And he'd fly down, never gobble. So if you were over here, you didn't, you didn't think nothing was there, but he'd be up in that tree. So there are trees that just historically, they like to roost. What I found is like they, a lot of times they like to, to, uh, to roost right on, the, right on the edge of a point where they can look. Because what, what are they doing? If the leaves are not really on, and even if they are, they can still see, but they like to get to where they can see on the ground floor of, that, of, of the woods because they want to look for hens especially by itself he wants to get just like we that's why we get up in a deer stand so we can see they want to get where they can see that's why they like to roost at the edge of a field a lot of times they want to get to where they can look out in that field from that limb and as soon as they see a hen fly down that field they're going to go right to it right so yeah there's trees that man every it's just like they congregate to to, to roost um so i look for roost trees on points uh, on ridge tops, but um, but especially points and edge of fields. If you got if you're hunting flat land or more agricultural, it just seems like you'll find them in a big tree. Usually it's a big tree, and you'll find them right on the edge of a creek, maybe you know right on where where there's maybe water underneath. Um, and uh, yeah, that's true. So when you find that roost tree. You need to mark it on your map. How you find a roost tree? Look at look at what's underneath it. You find droppings. You find feathers. It's a roost tree. Mark it on your map. And if they ain't gobbling, go in there and sit. A lot of times you'll look right up in that tree and you'll be right there. Done it many times. Do you do you hunt decoys at all, or do you kind of shy away from decoys? Or yeah, I get that question a lot. I I'm not a decoy hunter. Now that said. I hunt, I got one decoy that I hunt with, uh, but it never comes out probably. I've had the same decoy. It's a little feather flex decoy. Uh, I've probably had it 10 years and I can guarantee you probably that 10 years, it's may come out a handful of times. Uh, here's the thing about decoys. Decoys is a tool. It's just a tool. Sometimes it can help you. Sometimes it can hurt you. And you wouldn't believe the people that has come up to me at shows or, or you know, they write me and say, man, I, I, and I, I hear the same thing. They'll say, man, I had these decoys out, gobbler come up and he got 60, 50, you know, 60, 70 yards from me, looked at my decoys, he's turned around and walked off. Why do you do that? Well, you know, decoys can help you or they can hurt you. Now, in the right situation, they can help you. I've killed, I've killed, you know, a few turkeys over decoys, but I only use it when I feel like it can help me. When I'm in a situation, when I feel like it can help me, there's probably a lot of turkeys I haven't killed that had I had that decoy out, it might have helped me kill that turkey, but I didn't kill it. That's fine. I'll go find another one. But there's been a lot of times where guys have put decoys up thinking because they watched it on television, they can do what them guys on television did. See, the problem that you, the problem, now they're not going to tell you this. Now I'm going to tell you some hidden secrets here, okay? The reason why a lot of these guys won't tell you on television 
that gobblers will shy away from decoys because they want to sell you that decoy. <laughs> they want to sell you that decoy. So it's a marketing thing. Now, what you see on television, on videos, that happens. I'm not saying it don't happen. They'll come into decoys. But you got to remember, they're hunting places that you can't hunt. They're hunting, they're hunting turkeys that me and you will never get to hunt. And they're probably hunting an outfitter that's got 2,000 acres and probably allows 20 turkey hunters on there a year. So the turkeys are very unpressured and they're very older turkeys usually, you know, they get a chance to grow. So a lot of the turkeys that come into these decoys are three, four, five year old turkeys that's looking to whoop up on them. What they don't show you is the times when they, these turkeys come in, they look and they do exactly what they do to you. They go whoop right back out because it's a subordinate gobbler. Gobbler comes out, looks, he, see, he hears that hen, he hears you back there, he's coming to her. He looks up and sees that strut and decoy, or he sees that Jake decoy, gets shot, turns around and walks off. But a lot of people will say, well, I did something wrong, you know, it was my calling. What you calling, it was the decoy. If you hadn't had that decoy out there, he'd come right in. In fact, there was a guy, call, uh, a guy called me one day, didn't know, I didn't even know who he was. You know, he just, he just asked me if he could talk to me on the phone and, and it's been a couple of years ago. And I said, you know, well, sure, you know, I mean, I guess. So he seemed like he was okay. He called me and he said, man, I've got this. He said, I've got these, these, these turkeys. He said, I just don't know what to do. He said, I'll go in there. I said, uh, and he had, uh, I'm not knocking these decoys, but he had three expensive uh, AVX decoys that he spent like, <laughs> you know, $250 or whatever for these decoys or more. So, and he had them in a the bag, you know, he was carrying them in. He said, I, I put these decoys out. But in his mind, he felt like he had to have, have a decoy to kill a turkey because that's what he saw on television. And he said, these turkeys just come out. And he said, for two days, they've come out and they've looked at these decoys. And, and, and he said, what am I doing wrong with these decoys? What am I doing wrong? I said, I'm going to tell you how to kill that. Because after he told me what the turkeys was doing, I said, I'm going to tell you how to kill that turkey tomorrow. And uh, I said, uh, okay. Or he said, okay. I said, take that decoy, put it in your bag, and don't even use it. And it shocked him. He's like, well, I, man, I like it. I said, if you want to kill him, take the decoy out. It's a subordinate gobbler. He ain't coming in. Next day, he took that decoy and put it in his vest, didn't even hunt with it. Got up, you know, and guess what happened? And turkeys come right in, and he shot one of them, sent me a picture. He, decoys will help you in the right situation but they're going to hurt you more times than they're going to help you in my opinion so i just don't hunt with them i and plus i, I want the turkey looking for me i want him to come looking for me and i know this may be this may be a little bit uh, selfish you know or maybe it's not right but i just feel like if if i've called that turkey in he's come looking for me i've accomplished more than i would with a decoy you know, it's like I've I've done something. I did it, and it wasn't just the decoy. Now, if you want to hunt with a decoy, fine. But just remember, it's a tool. It's not guaranteed. And if you're having a problem with the turkeys shying away from it, you're hunting a bunch of turkeys that's probably subordinate, and uh, you got you learn to hunt without them. You'll be a lot more successful. All right, and we got one more question, and um, it it pertains to the trees again. Is there a particular species of trees that you will not find turkeys in, or do they flock to say oak tree, a large oak trees, or um, is there a special tree out there? I don't think so. I mean, that, that, they'll you know they they will use a, a bigger probably a bigger sized tree, but I don't think there's probably trees they won't unless it's little old bitty bushes and stuff like that. Saplings they probably won't, but they're going to get where they can get out of danger. So they're going to get pretty high up where they can get, you know, where they don't think nothing can get them in the day. So, or night, I mean. So I just look for some really big, tall trees. It don't have to be huge, just long as it's big enough to get them off the ground, you know. So, but I've seen them roosting cedars. I've seen them roosting oaks and hickories. I've seen them roosting all of them, you know. Well, Matt, we're coming down to the end of it. Um, I want to remind everyone to uh, – Follow Matt on his YouTube channel, Dell Outdoors. Go to his Instagram uh, and, and follow him there. 
and go to his Facebook, you know, um, like I, like I said before, we're going to have a series with Matt. We got two more shows coming. We're going to try and do these each week. So we'll have another one next week, uh, on Thursday of next week. And, uh, we'll, we'll pick the topic at that point. We'll probably get into more in depth, um, turkey setups and, and some, some problems that we all run into, you know, windy day calling and yep. how do you get a turkey to come in when you see him across a fence or a body of water or something like that. Things we all have problems with. Uh, uh, Matt, you have any, anything to add? Uh, just everybody come join me on, uh, make sure to subscribe to my videos, like he said. And uh, I've got, uh, I've got, Box calls, my signature series box calls, Spring Fever. Remember, springfevercustomcalls.com. You can pick up my box call. I got a signature series mouth call, uh, 2.5 mouth call, and all the other mouth calls. Uh, you can pick up a good, you know, slate, just a bunch of calls they have there. But my signature series, you can check them out, Spring Fever Custom Calls. And um, just uh, the stuff we're going to get into probably next week is 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 going to be very informational. Uh, you know, strut zones. You know, how to kill a turkey when he's hung up. How to hunt a strut zone. But go to a lot of if, you know if you never watched any of my videos. What you're going to find on Dell Outdoors, you know, you're probably not going to find a lot of heads getting blown off because there's plenty of guys out there that 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 do that. When I started Dell Outdoors, my my biggest thing was I wanted to teach people how to turkey hunt and deer hunt, but especially turkey hunt. There's just not enough. The information y'all got tonight, there's just not enough of it out there. So guys go out and they get discouraged because they, they buy all this equipment, they buy all this stuff, they buy their license and they buy all this stuff and then they go out and the turkeys beat the crap out of them because they don't know turkey behavior. You know, when I get, and every year I get people that send me a picture or they'll write and say, man, I killed my first turkey. After all these years, I finally killed my first turkey by listening to your videos. That's my reward right there. And uh, if you, I've always said, if you help a guy kill his first turkey, you've got a fan for life. <laughs> so so that's what I do. But go over there and check it out. I got a lot of great uh, information and looking forward to the next, uh, you know, the next few. And hopefully it'll make you a better turkey hunter here than well, about a month, we'll be after them. Matt, thanks for joining us tonight.